All right, thanks so much, Elaine, for that introduction. Um, like she said, I'm Vicki Steves, the librarian for research data management and reproducibility at New York University. I'm joined uh, by Sarah Nguyen, who is a research scientist also at NYU. Our third team member on this project, Genevieve Milliken, is in the chat, so be sure to give a nice hello there. So to start us off, we're going to be talking about Ice Age. And yes, the uh, acronym doesn't match the pronunciation, um, but that's just the way it goes. Ice Age is an Alfred P. Sloan-funded project that looks at basically two streams of work to try and uh, help with saving all of y'all's work that is in the Git data format on Git hosting platforms. So those two streams of work include a behavioral study around how folks in academia are using Git and Git hosting platforms, uh, which Sarah will talk about way more in depth. Um, the second stream of work focuses on evaluating how um, those materials are currently being archiving, archived and how we can uh, assist and aid and where the gaps are and, and where we can move forward as a community. So the goal of this project in, in a nutshell is to make sure the wonderful work that you all are doing, producing uh, great um, Git repos and the context that adds to its meaning, such as issue threads, PR discussions, wikis, can go from this really highly active collaborative state to a state where they are stable, citable, and under professional preservation. So here are the three of us pictured, um, but I also wanted to just mention this work would not be possible without our amazing colleagues in NYU Libraries Digital Library Technology Services, which is our digital preservation unit. And before I get too ahead of myself, I'm, most of y'all at CSV are probably familiar, but before we go into some more depth, I want to make sure everyone has the same baseline understanding of what Git is. Um, Git is basically a revision control system. It's a command line tool. Uh, the point of Git and other revision control systems is to be able to compare, restore, and merge changes to our plain text materials like code. So using Git facilitates collaboration, transparency, obviously something CSV and us care a lot about, which is awesome. So we love Git. Uh, there are also these things that we're calling Git hosting platforms. They're literally platforms on the web where people either host a copy uh, or host a copy of their Git repositories. They add some features on top that enable wider spread collaboration as well. So the most popular is GitHub followed by GitLab, Bitbucket, and SourceForge. So we're focusing on those. But as you can see from this very small screenshot from Wikipedia, there are a lot more. I especially want to give a shout out to SourceHut, which is a has this really cool sort of non- uh, this cooperative model for ho a hosting platform that looks really interesting. So check out SourceHut. And since this project has scholarly in the title, and we're going to be saying things like scholarly ephemera to denote parts of a repository we want to save, I thought we should show you some concrete examples of what exactly we mean by scholarly Git usage. So there are some of the perhaps more obvious ones, like using GitHub to publish data and code as supplementary materials to a paper. But there are also some really interesting uses. Um, how Ye was in the Yeni group, if you caught his presentation yesterday, and I gave a shout out to this bioarchive preprint, it's my favorite one. It details really in depth how they went from a manual quality assurance uh, procedure for their, for their lab, for their data, to an automated one using GitHub and Travis. So using this uh, Git hosting platform, which is meant to do software engineering to do automatic QA, QC on data is a really awesome scholarly usage. Um, but even there are whole journals that run on top of GitHub's infrastructure, such as the Journal of Open Source Software, JOS, and then the Journal of Open, uh, of Open Educational, it's Jose. Uh, and they conduct peer review in the entire publishing workflow on, on GitHub. So these are some of what we mean when we say scholarly Git usage. And the extent to which this is present in Git hosting platforms is pretty big. Um, Sarah's going to talk a little bit uh, about some of this scoping in depth, but I really love this background piece that comes from Hasselbring et al. Um, I highly recommend you all read the preprint. They basically identified 5,000 uh, repositories that host research software specifically. Um, they did that by looking at GitHub itself, but then also citations of repositories in ACM's digital library and archive. They found the most were in life science, the next were in general science, 
And then the third were unpublished or archives, which is like backups. So these are some really interesting um, scoping of the extent that this material is present. So then the problem we want to solve is there's all this uh, really interesting tooling going on around using Git, um, so many different platforms. This source code by itself is really valuable, but it's also contextualized by the scholarly ephemera around it, like issue discussions. And no current project captures both the source code and that ephemera. So we want to be able to get everything together. My uh, emoji and my elephant in the room, which didn't actually show up, my bad, uh, is GitHub's archiving program, which you may or may not have heard about. I'm not going to say a lot about it because David Rosenthal's blog post there that I linked at the bottom says everything you need to say. Um, but I will also just highlight that none of these projects are really solving the problem that we want to solve in that keeping the code together with this scholarly ephemera um, to everyone's benefit. Um, so I'm going to pass it off to Sarah, who's going to talk about uh, the gap analysis. Hi, everyone. This is Sarah. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Yep. So um, as Vicky said, my name is Sarah Nguyen, and I am the research scientist focusing on Git, um, on the behavioral side of Git and Git hosting platforms. Next slide, please. So. Um, Throughout my research, I've uh, basically phased it out into five different parts, starting with a literature review of just anyone who has um, mentioned Git, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket in their papers or in their studies. Um, and then we go into systematic review, uh, a focus group, broad survey, and user experience interviews. I'm going to be focusing most of the, today's talk on our broad survey, um, as that's something that we've had some uh, preliminary data to share. Um, but if we go to the next slide, I can share with you basically the research questions that we're focusing on as we do the when we started off with the literature review, um, which is basically just seeing how scholars use Git and Git hosting platforms as a toolkit to carry out their specific use cases, which is pretty similar to programmers and anyone else that uses Git, but specifically we're trying to just make sure that we can serve as librarians and archivists, those people who are doing things that are research and education based. Um, and then we also in the end want to be able to teach people who have experienced Git but have not yet been able to fully incorporate it into their workflow. How do we better introduce this topic to them and how do we better make it so they can bake it into their workflow process? So feel free to check out our blog that we've been updating um, as we just go through different types of papers and just a summary of all of those. Next slide, please. So just listening to yesterday's talk, it seems pretty, it was awesome just to see other people who are also just studying how people can use Git and make science and just research and information more open. So it's very similar to how many developers already use it, but we did pinpoint these um, Git experiences, specifically how scholars use them through the literature review. And obviously that's version control because that is what Git is based off of. But community and collaboration was a huge one, just like as Git hosting platforms are social coding platforms. Um, method tracking, we see those through lab notebooks. Education, Git, all in the, all of those different hosting platforms have a classroom setting. Data processing, reproducibility, publishing. Publishing is a huge one. So these are all uh, specific buckets into what we call scholarly use cases. And if we go to the next slide, um, this is just a paper that we want to highlight because it recently came out just this past week and it was written by a graduate student on just how they overcame barriers using open source software. And they also um, referenced Git and Git hosting platforms as a main point of use as they used um, open source software and collaborated with their uh, peers. So I highly recommend you check that out. So if you go to the next slide, I'm going to give you some examples of um, just very relevant use cases of how scholars and researchers are using Git. So uh, many of you might know that Johns Hopkins University Center for Systems and Science and Engineering came out with this awesome dashboard based off of Esri, um, just showing the spread of COVID-19. So they are actually um, posting their data on GitHub and their visuals are being fed to on Esri. So they're connecting the two platforms together. 
And you can see there's about more than 1,200 issues, but those are not being preserved in a specific way. Yes, Git is a decentralized way where each person can take the source code, but these types of conversations that are happening on issues and pull requests are what we're interested in because that kind of just um, plays into the scholarly workflow of peer review and collaboration. So that's just one repository. Next slide, please. This next GitHub repository is another one that I like to um, highlight because it is also very relevant to COVID-19. Some of you might have seen some discussion happening on the interwebs last week about how um, this code base that was basically saying that um, this type of modeling could show and reveal some information on how to reduce COVID-19 mortality. And this, <clears throat> it was basically taken down and also retracted even though it was just a preprint of a report, but in this issue, which is closed, um, there was a long discussion of how they're testing it um, and there was many bugs, which no one is a perfect coder, but it's just so important to be able to see this type of discussion happening throughout um, these types of data and modeling and scripts and code, um, which isn't currently being saved in many of the platforms that we're looking at. If you go to the next slide. So after the literature review of just looking at what pe how people are using Git through com conversing through issues, um, I'm interested in going through a systematic review, uh, basically seeing how all published papers, how have they been referencing URLs and um, to Git hosting platforms and Git within their workflow. So this would just be a large harvest of articles and metadata. Um, I'm not going to go too much into that because this is, this phase is still a work in progress. Um, next slide, please. So phase two of the research is a focus group, which is also in progress right now. We've been um, interviewing small groups of three to six uh, researchers, students, um, anyone who is what we call a minimal user. So someone who has been exposed to understanding or just un has seen the world of Git, but has not yet been able to incorporate it into their workflow. And we're mostly interested in this because a lot of people will be found are enthusiastic about version control systems and Git being a very popular one for exposure um, is something that they get excited about once they're in the classroom, but it's, they tend not to bring it over into their daily workflow. So within these focus groups, we want to understand what is that bottleneck? What is that threshold where they just cannot enter that door, open up that door to include Git into their workflow? So we're excited to see how um, that is incorporated. Uh, one tweet that we'd like to highlight is from Christy Whitaker, Kirsty Whitaker from the Allen in um, Turing Institute. And she was basically talking about how her experience of teaching someone a pull request, which is kind of a foundation to using Git and sharing code and source code with each other. But if you can't even get over this one barrier of a pull request, how are you supposed to even incorporate it into your larger workflow with all of the other different types of commands? So this is something that we're interested in of just making tools and a toolkit for people to understand. And then part three of the research is a survey, um, which we hope you all can participate in and share with your colleagues. Um, this, our target population are any scholars and users who use Git across all disciplines and statuses, whether you're a minimal user or an advanced user. And we just want to get in a wide range and comparable census of just how you were introduced to Git, how you learned it, who taught you, do you teach it, what's your daily use behavior. The survey takes less than 10 minutes, so I hope you're able to um, participate and so we can get your feedback. Five minutes. Next, five minutes. <laughs> I'm just slow at clicking uh, multiple choice buttons. So um, some preliminary findings within this survey. Again, Mr. Cautious Cohn is telling you, please participate and share widely if you have time. Um, one of the first questions that we do ask is, when did you first start using a version control system? And this is just a nice time series. Um, Obviously, this is a very small population right now, as we just as we only recently put out the survey. But um, I'm excited to see any sort of trends of the year that someone has picked up a Git or a version control system and what major events have happened around that. Um, we can see a spike happened in 2005 when Git was born. I can't say that's clearly correlated, but that is something that is interesting to me. Um, 
It was also interesting just to see that uh, in 1990, we haven't had anyone who has uh, adopted a version control system immediately after 1994 or earlier. Um, and then it's, it'll be interesting to see when funding agencies start mandating data and source code be made openly available, will there be an actual spike in there? A few years afterwards, we do see this in 2015, which I haven't been able to find a, a notable event timeline for that year, but um, if anyone has experienced anything or remembers from their memory, it'd be great to hear that. Next slide, please. Uh, another preliminary finding um, is we do ask people what version control system did you start out using and what version control system do you use now? Because as you, we all know, we're all interested and curious about learning about different technologies. So just because you started it with Git doesn't actually mean that you'll stick with it. Um, if you learn Mercurial or SVN, which uh, has been pretty rare, uh, um, to be honest, obviously, just because many places have been um, not supporting other types of version control systems. But um, it'll be interesting to see. In the other category, other people had, um, participants had submitted that they use Microsoft SourceSafe, Perforce, Fossil, Darks. So um, there's a lot of different version control systems that people actually do still use. Next slide, please. So why did you first enter the world of Git in version control? I like this question just because it's kind of like your motivation or intention to version control. Um, obvious factor is that we just need a version control system. Um, in our focus group, something interesting is all of our focus group attendees who are minimal users, um, they had stated that this, they heard that it would get a job, get them a job in the future, which for right now, uh, we see that not very many people have responded to that. Um, other types of reasons on why people have entered the world of Git and version control was that um, their workplace was requiring the use of it, or it was required for a web development course that they took. Um, someone said that they needed to back up their code, which is really interesting to us just because we are looking at the preservation aspect of it for long-term use. Um, others wanted to replicate the code on multiple computers, um, better documentation for complex projects, which is also, also something that we're really excited about just because we do see this um, type of version control system as a, a way so that we can have code and open science. Um, someone also said that uh, it was superior to SVN, which I find is funny. So this next one is uh, Sarah. Kind of may maybe for the sake of time, we'll uh, run through this a little quicker so I can do the final overview. Oh yeah. So yeah. let's just skip ahead to part. So basically, we have quite a few preliminary findings, but if we skip ahead to part four, which is basically the closing of understanding the behaviors behind Git, is we're going to be doing user experience interviews. So we hope to be able to take some more one-on-one -on -one time with participants um, to understand how you actually use Git. And now I'll pass it to Vicky so we can wrap it up. And the last question of the survey does ask if you want to participate in this, so we hope you will. I'm just going to really briefly go over uh, part of Genevieve's project, uh, side of the project. So obviously she's available to answer questions. This is her beautiful bunny, Oshi. Um, and she did basically a huge environmental scan in parallel uh, to the work Sarah's been doing, looking at four key areas uh, of the of ways that people are capturing and preserving source code and ephemera. Um, so I'll go through them briefly. So web archiving, which is the use of crawlers or similar software to capture and preserve the look and feel of content on the web. Um, so projects of interest I'll talk a little bit about later, archive it, web recorder, and memento tracer. We're also interested in self archiving, which uh, hopefully a lot of you have done now that you're familiar with Zenodo. This is uh, looking at the motivations of depositing core, uh, code into general like Zenodo subject like GenBank or institutional repositories. Um, so what are the motivations between uh, for where people choose to put their codes, uh, put their code, what makes one platform more attractive than the other? Where is the feature parity? Um, questions like that. We're also interested in the use of APIs, indexers to automatically capture this code. So obviously Software Heritage is the big one in this space where they uh, have public copies of many uh, public repos um, across multiple Git hosting platforms, including sunsetted platforms like Google Code. They have all the open material in Google Code. 
Um, so they're capturing the source code, and then there are projects like GH Archive and GH Torrent that are capturing the ephemera using uh, GitHub's API. And then there's a really awesome project, Sarah, which allows, uh, it's a mix of programmatic capture and self-deposit, um, where basically you make a copy to an institution's GitLab, and then some metadata is put into an institutional repository for greater discovery. So very cool. And then obviously the last piece is software preservation, which is around sort of the best practices in curating and making accessible for the long term um, source code, but also compiled binaries in those um, ephemera. Some projects of interest include obviously Software Preservation Network, which is a member based organization similar to the Data Curation Network, which is also member based. Um, I'm really interested in drawing the line between SPIN and DCN, especially because DCN produces really excellent primers on writing code for data curators. Um, but also of interest are the UK and US Research Software Sustainability Institutes, which forefront open, reproducible, sustainable practices for research software. All Time. of this. Ah, ah, we did some <laughs> tool testing. We're going to do more. Here's all of our info. Talk to us. Thank you. Sorry. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Sorry Vicky about Sarah, that. Vicky and Sarah will be available on Slack. Um, if you are more keen and would like to know more, thank you so much for your talk. It was very insightful. And you explained Git in a new way that I've never heard of before. And now I get it. Thank you. Hey, good.